We continue today with the Course in Miracles Manual for Teachers. Number 24. Is Reincarnation So? In the ultimate sense, reincarnation is impossible. There is no past or future, and the idea of birth into a body has no meaning either once or many times. Reincarnation cannot then be true in any real sense. Our only question should be, is the concept helpful? And that depends of course on what it is, it is used for. If it is used to strengthen the recognition of the eternal nature of life, it is helpful indeed. Is any other question about it really useful in lighting up the way? Like many other beliefs, it can be bitterly misused. At least, such misuse offers preoccupation and perhaps pride in the past. At worst, it induces inertia in the present. In between, many kinds of folly are possible. Reincarnation would not, under any circumstances, be the problem to be dealt with now. If it were responsible for some of the difficulties the individual faces now, his task would still be only to escape from them now. If he is laying the groundwork for a future life, he can still work out his salvation only now. To some, there may be comfort in the concept, and if it heartens them, its value is self-evident. It is certain, however, that the way to salvation can be found by those who believe in reincarnation and by those who do not. The idea cannot, therefore, be regarded as essential to the curriculum. There is always some risk in seeing the present in terms of the past. There is always some good in any thought which strengthens the idea that life and the body are not the same. For our purposes, it would not be helpful to take any definite stand on reincarnation. A teacher of God should be as helpful to those who believe in it as to those who do not. If a definite stand were required of him, it would merely limit his usefulness, as well as his own decision-making. Our course is not concerned with any concept that is not acceptable to anyone, regardless of his formal beliefs. His ego will be enough for him to cope with, and it is not the part of wisdom to add sectarian controversies to his burdens nor would there be an advantage in his premature acceptance of the Course merely because it advocates a long-held belief of his own. It cannot be too strongly emphasized that this Course aims at a complete reversal of thought. When this is finally accomplished, issues such as the validity of reincarnation become meaningless. Until then, they are likely to be merely controversial. The teacher of God is, therefore, wise to step away from all such questions, for he has much to teach and learn apart from them. He should both learn and teach that theoretical issues but waste time, draining it away from its appointed purpose. If there are aspects to any concept or belief that will be helpful, he will be told about it. He will also be told how to use it. What more need he know? Does this mean that the teacher of God should not believe in reincarnation himself or discuss it with others who do? The answer is certainly not. If he does not believe in, to, he believes in reincarnation, it would be a mistake for him to renounce the belief unless his internal teacher so advised. And this is most unlikely. He might be advised that he is misusing the belief in some way that is detrimental to his pupil's advance or his own. Reinterpretation would then be recommended because it is necessary. All that must be recognized, however, is that birth was not the beginning and death is not the end. Yet even this much is not required of the beginner. He need merely accept the idea that what he knows is not necessarily all there is to learn. His journey has begun. 
The emphasis of this course always remains the same. It is at this moment that complete salvation is offered you, and it is at this moment that you can accept it. This is still your one responsibility. Atonement might be equated with total escape from the past and total lack of interest in the future. Heaven is here. There is nowhere else. Heaven is now. There is no other time. No teaching that does not lead to this is of concern to God's teachers. All beliefs will point to this if properly interpreted. In this sense, it can be said that their truth lies in their usefulness. All beliefs that lead to progress should be honored. This is the sole criterion this course requires. No more than this is necessary. Are psychic powers desirable? The answer to this question is much like the preceding one. There are, of course, no, quote, unnatural powers, and it is obviously merely an appeal to magic to make up a power that does not exist. It is equally obvious, however, that each individual has many abilities of which he is aware. As his awareness increases, he may well develop abilities that seem quite startling to him. Yet nothing he can do can compare even in the slightest with the glorious surprise of remembering who he is. Let all his learning and all his efforts be directed toward this one great final surprise, and he will not be content to be delayed by the little ones that may come to him on the way. Certainly there are many psychic powers that are clearly in line with this course. Communication is not limited to the small range of channels the world recognizes. If it were, there would be little point in trying to teach salvation. It would be impossible to do so. The limits the world places on communication are the chief barriers to direct experience of the Holy Spirit, whose presence is always there and whose voice is available but for the hearing. These limits are placed out of fear for without them the walls that surround all the separate places of the world would fall at the holy sound of his voice. Who transcends these limits in any way is merely becoming more natural. He is doing nothing special, and there is no magic in his accomplishments. The seemingly new abilities that may be gathered on the way can be very helpful. Given to the Holy Spirit and used under His direction, they are valuable teaching aids. To this, the question of how they arise is irrelevant. The only important consideration is how they are used. Taking them as ends in themselves, no matter how this is done, will delay progress. Nor does their value lie in proving anything. Achievements from the past, unusual attunement with the unseen, or special favors from God. God gives no special favors, and no one has any powers that are not available to everyone. Only by tricks of magic are special powers, quote, demonstrated. Nothing that is genuine is used to deceive. The Holy Spirit is incapable of deception, and he can use only genuine abilities. What is used for magic is useless to him, but what he uses cannot be used for magic. There is, however, a particular appeal in unusual abilities that can be curiously tempting. Here are strengths which the Holy Spirit wants and needs, yet the ego sees in these same strengths an opportunity to glorify itself. Strengths turned to weakness are tragedy indeed. Yet, what is not given to the Holy Spirit must be given to weakness, for what is withheld from love is given to fear, and will be fearful in consequence. Even those who no longer value the material things of the world may still be deceived by psychic powers. And as investment has been withdrawn 
from the world's material gifts, the ego has been seriously threatened. It may still be strong enough to rally under this new temptation to win back strength by guile. Many have not seen through the ego's defenses here, although they are not particularly subtle. Yet given a remaining wish to be deceived, deception is made easy. Now the power is no longer a genuine ability and cannot be used dependably. It is almost inevitable that, unless the individual changes his mind about its purpose, he will bolster his power's uncertainties with increasing deception. Any ability that anyone develops has the potentiality for good. To this there is no exception, and the more unusual and unexpected the power, the greater its potential usefulness. Salvation has need of all abilities, for what the world would destroy, the Holy Spirit would restore. Psychic abilities have been used to call upon the devil, which merely means to strengthen the ego. Yet here is also a great channel of hope and healing in the Holy Spirit's service. Those who have developed psychic powers have simply let some of the limitations they laid upon their minds be lifted. It can be but further limitations they lay upon themselves, if they utilize their increased freedom for greater imprisonment. The Holy Spirit needs these gifts, and those who offer them to Him, and Him alone, go with Christ's gratitude upon their hearts, and His holy sight not far behind. Can God be reached directly? God indeed can be reached directly, for there is no distance between Him and His Son. His awareness is in everyone's memory, and His Word is written on everyone's heart. Yet this awareness and this memory can arise across the threshold of recognition only where all barriers to truth have been removed. In how many is this the case? Here then is the role of God's teachers. They too have not attained the necessary understanding as yet, but they have joined with others. This is what sets them apart from the world, and it is this that enables others to leave the world with them. Alone they are nothing, but in their joining is the power of God. There are those who have reached their God directly retaining no trace of worldly limits and remembering their own identity perfectly. These might be called the teachers of teachers, because although they are no longer visible, their image can yet be called upon, and they will appear when and where it is helpful for them to do so. To those whom such appearances would be frightening, they give their ideas. No one can call on them in vain nor is there anyone of whom they are unaware. All needs are known to them, and all mistakes are recognized and overlooked by them. The time will come when this is understood, and meanwhile they give all their gifts to the teachers of God who look to them for help, asking all things in their name and in no other. Sometimes a teacher of God may have a brief experience of direct union with God, in this world it is almost impossible that this endure. It can perhaps be won after much devotion and dedication, and then be maintained for much of the time on earth. But this is so rare that it cannot be considered a realistic goal. If it happens, so be it. If it does not happen, so be it as well. All worldly states must be illusory. If God were reached directly in sustained awareness, the body would not be long maintained. Those who have laid the body down merely to extend their helpfulness to those remaining behind are few indeed. And they need helpers who are still in bondage and still asleep, so that by their awakening can God's voice be heard. Do not despair then because of limitations. It is your function to escape from them, but not to be without them. If you would be heard by those who suffer, you must speak their language. 
If you would be a savior, you must understand what it needs to be escaped. Salvation is not theoretical. Behold the problem, ask for the answer, and then accept it when it comes. Nor will its coming be long delayed. All the help you can accept will be provided, and not one need you have will not be met. Let us not, then, be too concerned with goals for which you are not ready. God takes you where you are and welcomes you. What more could you desire when this is all you need?